there was only enough oil to last for one night. Right. And that it took eight days for them to get more oil and that the oil miraculously lasted for eight nights. So that's why it's an eight night festival. From the front lines, this is War Room with Pastor Wendy McDonald, with our special guest, Pastor Jenny Cook Stefali. And now, War Room, you are the resistance. Well, welcome to the War Room, Jenny. And it's so awesome to have you with me again. And uh, it's such a strategic time of the year. And I know that God is speaking to the earth through his church and especially through you in this season. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about Hanukkah. And as I was saying to you a little earlier on, sometimes Christians think Hanukkah is the Jewish Christmas. And uh, you were explaining to me that uh, it's, it's not really. So, yeah. <laughs> and and we know that it's not listed in the book of Leviticus. So if you'll just go ahead and begin to explain what it is yeah. and what it means and and the significance of it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, Hanukkah certainly has been thought of as the Jewish Christmas and for good reason in the sense that, you know, it kind of what we see of Hanukkah today, the decorations, the gift giving. I mean, people even have Hanukkah trees now where they decorate their Christmas tree like Hanukkah, um, which is, is kind of funny because it's not really not how this holiday originated. It morphed into that. I mean, much like a lot of our holidays do, Christmas morphed and changed. And, you know, Hanukkah did change into more of a Jewish Christmas with the gift giving because, it, I mean, that side of it, little Jewish boys and girls were jealous when Christian kids got presents on Christmas. And so the gift giving exchange began, um, you know, I, I was joking with you before somebody said to me once, well, it's kind of, like, you know, they wanted to one up the Christians, you know, <laughs> you'll get a present, <laughs> you'll get a present like every day. You get presents, every one of you, I've got, you know, so we, <laughs> we get one on Christmas. That's good for you. We get eight, you know, eight crazy nights. Um, and that's what it's become. Um, but really there's so much significance prophetically, biblically to this holiday that people don't know about. Yes, it is not mentioned in Leviticus 23. And so because of that, there are people, um, even in the Messianic communities that have suggested, well, Hanukkah is just this tradition. It's not a holiday that's necessarily biblical, but it really is biblical. We're going to find the story of Hanukkah listed in both Daniel, the Old Testament, Wow. Uh, actually the New Testament. So I just want to start wow. again and turn to John. I should have already been there, but um, John chapter 10, I just want to read it to you. Come on, Jenny. I know where John is. <laughs> John chapter 10. It talks about Jesus. If, if you have a Bible, you can look there, but it says in verse 22. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem and it was winter and Yeshua walked in the temple in Solomon's porch then the Jews surrounded him and said, how long will you keep us in doubt? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Well, this should get our attention. One of the few times they come to him and say, are you the Christ? Why are they asking him right now? It's kind of a big deal. Well, yes. this time was what the Feast of Dedication. What is the Feast of Dedication? Hanukkah. Hanukkah oh, is wow. the Feast of Dedication. It's known as well as the Feast or Festival of Lights. Yes. Uh, but that's become more known as the Festival of Lights. The reason it's known, of course, as the Festival of Lights is because, you know, we have the Hanukkah. The Hanukkah is like the menorah. The menorah is going to have seven branches. And, yes. and there are some that say really, you know, the Hanukkah is never mentioned in the Bible. So I know some uh, believers or Jewish people that, that actually don't use a Hanukkah. Um, they still use the menorah because it's to symbolize uh, the story that everybody has kind of learned about for years that the oil ran out and so that they were able to. So we uh, got one of these from the Jewish synagogue in Seapoint today. So is that is that what it okay. looks like? That's an interesting one. Okay, so this is a perfect example. So so this is a Hanukkah. So the menorah would have seven branches. This one has, um, if you count there, you go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then you've got the, the one that's sitting up top and that's the ninth yeah. branch. And that branch is known as the shamash. Shamash okay. in Hebrew means servant. 
So oh. it's the servant candle. So you use this candle to light all the other candles. Well, think oh, about wow. it. You know, Jesus talked about being the light of the world, but then tells us that we are the light. So, you know, that whole, this little light of mine, you know, I'm going to let it shine. I mean, yeah. that's really the picture of this. He is the light of the world, but he lights us and we in turn then light others and we bring light into dark places. Wow. So that's what's wow. so beautiful about the Shamash candle, you know, is it is it's the helper. It, the, the, again, it's it's you no know, the word Shamash is servant, but it really means the helper. So even though we know this is representative of the light of the world, Yeshua, it really is representative as well of the Holy Spirit, who Yeshua said, I'm gonna send you a what? A helper. He said, oh, I'm gonna send you a Shamash yes, to to you know to bring light. And so so yeah, that's known as the festival of lights. Did you I'm sorry, Wendy Pastor Wendy? Did you read no, it? I was looking at the fact that there are uh, one, two, three, four, there are eight candles. Yeah. And the significance of the eight candles would be eight sure. days, I'm sure. Okay. So here's where I'm going to talk about a little bit of legend, and then I'm going to go into the history of it. Yes. So, so we have the eight days as opposed to the where you would normally have the uh, – the six candles and then the set, it would be the menorah would be six. And then the shamash, the, the seven, seven the yes. middle, right? So you'd have three and three. And anytime you read about the menorah, you read about three and the three and the middle candle. Okay. Yes. You read right to Zechariah, read that Leviticus Old Testament. This is eight because this is the theory uh, that, that was added much later. But what is celebrated now is that when, and we'll have to go back so we understand this, but when Thank the you. temple was rededicated, in which we'll go back and understand, that there was only enough oil to last for one night. Right. And that it took eight days for them to get more oil and that the oil miraculously lasted for eight nights. So that's why it's an eight night festival. Now that was added in the Talmud about 400 years after the very first feast of dedication. So it is speculated that it was added that it's not necessarily why it's eight days. I'm going to go back a little, if you don't mind on the history Yes. So we can see why it really is eight days and why it's still okay to celebrate for eight days. Uh, so can I give you a little bit of history lesson? Yes, please. I'd love it. And yes. You don't have to hold that up if you don't want okay. to. I don't know how heavy that is, but I'll, I'll, let me just go back. Like no, no, it's just, it's quite light. Oh, and good, good. And I have got one in the back. Oh, great. Uh, well, okay. So as I said, it's the Feast of Dedication, but we need to understand what this dedication is, why the lights, why the relighting of the tabernacle. And so where I said this comes in at Daniel, if you turn to Daniel uh, chapter eight, and now we know that Daniel is prophetic about end times, right? But yes. the way Daniel works and the way the Bible works in a lot of ways is that you have foreshadowing, you have a first time something happens, and then you also, it can happen again. So with Daniel, many of the things he talks about already happened. Okay. But there is also, it's for a time and then a time in the future, sort of like Yeshua already came, but he's coming again. Right. So in Daniel chapter eight, we talk about, I want to go to verse eight. And we're just going to understand this because this ties in to Hanukkah. Daniel prophesied Hanukkah. So just to pick up in here in Daniel chapter eight, verse eight, it says that the male goat grew very great. When he became strong, the large horn was broken. And in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. So this has actually already happened. This is talking about Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great became a great king. So some of you may already know this. Well, this is just going to be a peripheral kind of thing. When it says the, when the, the horn was broken and four horns, little horns came up, four notable ones, sorry, came up in its place. When Alexander the Great died, I think it was like 333, when he died, he didn't have a successor. So there were four generals that stood up and took his place. Yes. Wow. Ptolemy, Antigonus, uh, Cassander, and Seleucius. Seleucius is the important one. So when Seleucius became one of the generals, he grew, his region grew to expand and to cover um, Asia. Um, uh, he didn't uh, take Egypt because of the relationship with the Romans. And I don't want to get too complicated. Again, yes, an, yes. Overview, an overview here. But Seleucius grew the Seleucid Empire. The Seleucid, in the Seleucid Empire, you have his son, Alexander, was born. 
um, uh, not, I'm, I'm sorry, Antiochus, his son Antiochus the first. So we have Alexander went to Seleucus. Seleucus has um, Antiochus the first. Now, Antiochus the first grows the kingdom, Antiochus the second, Antiochus the third, things sort of started to, they lost a little bit of their power. And then Antiochus the fourth is born. Antiochus the fourth renames himself Antiochus Epiphanes. Yes. Now, this is w- the one we kind of know about. Now, if we go back into Daniel 8, where we said the four horned, notable one, sorry, came up out up towards the four winds of heaven, and out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south. That's the Seleucid Empire. Out of the four came one. That's the Seleucid. Okay, so that's Seleucus. Um, which, whose horn grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. Well, where is the glorious land? What would the Bible call the glorious land? Obviously, yeah, Israel. this is Israel. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground, trampled them. Now, this growth of this new horn is referring to Antiochus Epiphanes, because it says out of. Okay, so out of that, one of those four generals, the Seleucid Empire, which Antiochus Epiphanes was Seleucus fourth, be like his grandson, third generation. Where was I? He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast down truth to the ground. He did all of this and prospered. So what this is talking about is in 167 um, BC, Antiochus conquers Jerusalem. Now, it was a really big deal for the Seleucid rulers for the empire to implement policies to encourage um hellenistic ways basically yes. to, to so so this is if you if, even in the new testament we hear about the hellenized jews if you've right. ever wondered when you read the hellenized jews hellenization was basically the greek influence on israel and so they were really um in encouraging them to adopt Hellenistic cultural values, the different things that they did, you know, uh, that they brought in. A lot of the Jews actually joined in. They sort of became a little hybrid. They kept their Jewish faith. They would still do Yom Kippur. They might still do Pesach, Passover, but they would start to do these Greek cultural things, but not everyone was. Well, there is a reason that Antiochus Epiphanes named himself that. And I think the reason is this. Antiochus Epiphanes, Epiphanes means God made manifest. Yes. Okay, so I think... So if you have an epiphany, that's like God being manifest. So God he, manifesting, he, or I have an epiphany, God spoke to me. Like I had this yes. revelation, okay? So he, he takes the name of God. He takes the name of God. Now, if you know that Isaiah was one of the main scripture scrolls that were read, even in the Babylonian um, captivity, people knew the uh, scrolls of Isaiah. Isaiah. So, so Seleucid Empire, all of this, they would have had access to Isaiah. I think because a king, a ruler was supposed to know the religions of the other nations so they could conquer them. They were so, I believe, this is just personal belief, that Antiochus actually read the prophecies about Messiah coming and being God with us, Emmanuel, yes. God with us. Yes. So I believe that he called himself that to try to encourage more of the Jewish people to see him as the Messiah, because wow. he obviously wanted worship because he set up yes. that idol of Zeus that he set up in the temple. He actually had it, the, uh, the idol of Zeus, his face was on the idol of Zeus. So he had an idol of himself put up in the temple and he commanded worship, not just to Zeus, but to himself because he saw himself as a God, much like the Egyptian rulers saw themselves as God. So not only does he do that, but he takes away, as we read about, he takes away the daily sacrifices. They could no longer sacrifice to you know Yahweh. Um, he cast down the sanctuary by uh, bringing in the, you know, the, um, uh, the different, you know, the different sacrifices, uh, the ob- abomination of desolation, as we hear about where he brought animal sacrifices, but pigs to be sacrificed on the altar, which he knew was an abomination to the Jewish people. So he's trying to be their Messiah, but he's really the Antichrist. He's really behaving as the anti-Messiah here. And so I, I really believe that he was doing that to try to 
win them over when that didn't work. So then he outlaws circumcision. He outlaws circumcision. He outlaws the study of Torah. He outlaws Shabbat. You cannot um, have Shabbat. If you're caught doing any of these things, you can be killed on the site. So this is actually where we get the dreidel from because people would meet in secret to study Torah. Families would gather in these home oh, wow. synagogues to study Torah. And what they had was these dreidels that they made, these little spin top toys um, that they would be studying Torah. But the plan was if any of the army or anybody, you know, that would turn them in came knocking at the door, they would get rid of the Torah scrolls, pull out the dreidels and they come in. What's going on here? Nothing, just a child's game. We're playing oh, wow. You know, they're playing. Of course, I have to make everybody in New York, you know, style. <laughs> uh, you know, this is what this is how we get the, the, the dreidel game, because they were protecting the fact that they were studying Torah because it was illegal to study Torah. So in this process is where we have the story of Hanukkah takes place. You have the Maccabees, who actually were a family, a, a he was a Matthias, Matthias was a, um, I want to say a Roman, he wasn't Roman, <laughs> he was a, a Jewish priest. And he was in this town that they came in and they said, you have to sacrifice, you know, to, to our gods. And they would make them go to their local synagogues and actually sacrifice to show that they had accepted these Hellenistic ways. Like, we're going to prove, you can't just tell us anymore, you got to go there and you got to sacrifice. So not only would, did Mattathias and his family say no, when he saw another Jewish person going along with this, going to the temple to sacrifice to the Greek gods, he rose up and he killed this man. Well, that seems so a little- in, in other words, he was resisting the abomination of desolation. Yeah, they were he, resisting. He was resisting that. And not only resisting, but he actually started a revolution by, you know, took, you know, you could look at this and say he took a life, but really Levitical law, they were supposed to. I mean, think about the story about Phineas um, in, uh, I think it's in Exodus. I can't remember where that was, where, where they brought, he brought the Midianite woman, you know, to the, to the tabernacle and um, tried to introduce her religion. And Phineas rises up you know, and thrusts them through with a javelin. And, and that sounds pretty intense, but like yes. God was like, do not involve, do not compromise your faith. That was the, one of the big things he said over and over and over again. Do not worship their idols. They will uh -huh. be a snare to you. Do not take on their customs. Do not take on their way. So Matthias and his sons were living in a time where the Jewish people were actually starting to do that. They built a gymnasium. Um, where the men would exercise in Jerusalem, which was actually, that seems like what's the big deal, but they exercised in the nude and there were things that were yes, like, totally like against, you, just, did. Yes. you know, yeah. And, and, and so, I mean, there were just a lot of Hellenistic things that the Jewish people had already taken on. So I always see Matthias as basically saying, I've, I've, I've stood all, all I can stand and I can stand no more, you know, and he rises up, he, he starts a revolution. Now, where we get the name Maccabees, which you really see the Maccabees being associated with Hanukkah, um, Judah Maccabees, you hear about this always, you know, um, in songs and tales and all that. Judah Maccabee was his son. Their name wasn't Maccabee, but Maccabee means the hammer. And he kind of got this nickname as the hammer because he rose up and he was just very, very strong. And so long story short, they started uprising. This little group of Jewish people that just basically said, I can't take this anymore. I can't take the Hellenization. I can't take my own brothers turning their backs on our God. And that said, mm -hmm. we're not going to stand for this. Guys, you might think you don't have a voice. You might think that we're small. We might think that we're being defeated by bigger armies that have a bigger agenda, but we have God on our side. And wow. sometimes God is just waiting for us to say enough is enough. I've had all I can yes. take. I cannot take anymore. I am taking a stand for God. I am not afraid anymore. And that's what it took. And I, and I feel so strongly about it because I think we're living in the same kind of time. Yes, yes, so yes. We're all really being influenced to just accept it. Go along with it. It's culturally what feels right. Don't stir the waters. And that's what this family was being told. And they just said, no, this goes against God. We cannot be so culturally minded that we're no spiritually good anymore because we're so 
you know, we become insignificant when it comes to the word of God, because we're so culturally indoctrinated into what is cool. I'm working on a book called Cultural Christianity, where we oh, have wow. allowed our culture to, I mean, our, our faith to be influenced by our culture. And this is what happened. And so, so just to get it back on track, you know, they, they, they rose up, they started this revolution and they defeated this huge army, this huge army, that was, army. The Seleucid army is one of the greatest armies in the world of the time. Yes. Wow. This little band of warriors that basically, I have a hair, sorry. Okay. <laughs> basically, they were guerrilla warfare. They just knew how to use what they had. They said, you know, what's in my hand? They would go up and they would, you know, they, they knew their land. And so they would, like guerrilla warfare, they would just come down and they'd hide in the mountains. They knew how to jump out and surprise attack. And they drove the, the Seleucid army out of Jerusalem. People don't realize what a humongous deal this is. But wow. it's really on the scale of what happened for Israel. I mean, when Israel yes. was reestablished and there were yes. this little tiny people and you have all the nations you know, the, you know, nations surrounding them, you know, in the uh, six day war, it's very similar. These tiny little people that didn't even know how to f go to war. They didn't, they weren't warriors. No. They were rabbis. They were uh, immigrants into this new land and uh, they rose up because they knew God was on their side. And that's one of the big th story takeaways we have to have from Hanukkah was that they, they said, look, it, it looks impossible. It looks impossible, but we know from the word of God that with man, when something is impossible with God, all things are possible. So they defeat this army. And the first thing that they do is they cleanse the temple. They say, you know, they know that this, the animals have been, you know, the pigs have been sacrificed there. They know that fake foreign gods started to say fake gods. Well, that's true. Yes. Uh, fake gods, foreign gods were, were put up there, were worshipped there. So they cleanse it. And, and, and it says, this is what's interesting, going back to Daniel. Um, verse 13, then I heard a holy one speaking. Another holy one said a certain to the certain one was speaking. How long will this be concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation or the abomination of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. And he said to me for 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Well, this literally, this lines up exactly, if you do the math, this is exactly the time period from when Daniel was given the vision to the time of the Maccabean revolt. And it's very possible, probably, that uh, the Maccabees knew this time. And they probably said, listen, it's already been prophesied. Our victory has already been written about in God's word. And, and that's why his word is so important for us. That's why... When Jesus was praying, right before he went to the garden, Jesus, it says he sang, you know, the disciples sung a hymn and they went to the garden. They sung mm -hmm. the hymn, the halal. And, and I teach on this with Passover. And I'd love to do Passover with you guys sometime. Yes, I'd love it. But in the halal, these words that Jesus saying, there are these words in the halal, Psalms 118, I shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Those were the words that Yeshua sang. The very last song he ever sang was, this is the stone which the builders have rejected. It has become the chief cornerstone. This is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. These are the words that Yeshua sang. They were planted, I believe, in the scripture for Yeshua himself to sing, to encourage himself in the truth of God's promises before he went to the cross. That he could say, I will live and not die and declare the works. And of it, is there is there a melody melody to that song, Jenny? You know, I don't know what it originally was. Uh, you know, a we uh, I've heard other versions of it. I'm not I wouldn't probably sing it for you guys. Um, no, I, I didn't know if it was just that, you know, a line that yeah, you know, it like is like a call and response in the in the song. You know, when they say they sung a hymn, um, yes. it's very possible that they, they sang it differently and that they, they had a portion of it. But we know to this day that there are part of the halal hymn and it is more like a canter. It is more like a, a yes, it is more like the canter sings and the people repeat. And so yes. we don't know how Yeshua sang it with his disciples, but he probably sang it like the canter and they probably repeated the words. I will uh, live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. How extraordinary. Beautiful. And so, for and us, how 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 seasonal and how you know accurate it is for the day in which we live today that God will take just a few, a remnant, if you would, yep. to defeat 
an overwhelming enemy. Just, yeah. j- it's just mind blowing and so encouraging in this season where you know th- there's so much darkness around. That here is uh, uh, light. There is the light. <laughs> And that's what's so beautiful about this festival. So it, Hanukkah falls on the 25th of Kislev. Okay, so Kislev is the 10th month. Hanukkah is the 25th day. Well, here's what's interesting. Now, Hanukkah, again, it's commemorated on the first day where they, where they rededicated that temple. And again, it's called Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah. Hanukkah means dedication. The word, um, the 25th word of the Torah, this is what's super cool. The 25th word of the, in the Torah, okay, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was dark. And, you know, I'm sorry, our earth was void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And God said, let there be what? Light. God said, let there be light. The word light is the 25th word in the Bible. Wow. When God called light out of darkness, it was the 25th word. Well, how very appropriate. God, there's no mistakes with God. How very appropriate that. Kislev 25, the 25th day was when the candle was lit to rededicate the tabernacles, rededicate, sorry, the temple. And so there is, there is a suggestion, of course, that the word 25 really refers to light. And that leads us, of course, back to the people who are walking in darkness, like Isaiah says, have seen a great light in the land. You know, we, we know that. And we know that when John talked about, you know, in John chapter one, he talks about the light coming into the world, right? And so for that, I want to say why this kind of is significant now for Christians in addition to all of this other stuff. There's a lot of talk about, you know, Christmas. Should we celebrate it? Should we not celebrate it? And, uh, you know, I've had, you know, Messianic people say, you know, it's, you may have heard this, it's absolutely pagan. There are pagan roots to it. There are pagan roots to a lot of things. <laughs> there, are, there really are. I mean, there are parts of Rosh Hashanah that have some pagan roots because they, the, the term Rosh Hashanah came about when they were in Babylon. There are, there are things but you, if you really look deeper, a lot of times you can see God's hand working. So the interesting thing about Kislev 25 is, is first of all, um, let me see if I can say this the easiest way without bringing up math. If you look at the story, we don't know for sure when Yeshua, when Jesus was born. We don't have, we, most people kind of have come to an agreement. It was probably not December 25th. Right. However, when you look at, the, the birth of John the Baptist, we know that Mary conceived when Elizabeth was around six months pregnant. Okay. The word tells us in the, in the sixth month. Okay. Now that could have either been her sixth month of pregnancy, or it could have been the sixth month of the Greek calendar, which was in March. Now, if that was the case, Jesus would have been conceived around March, would have had him be born in December around Hanukkah. So that's really, an, there's an interesting argument there. And there's people that if you look at, um, so Zachariah, when you look at when he served in the temple, there were these divisions. He was the division of Adonijah. So during his division, there are, there are documentations that document when his division would have served. There are two possible times he served twice a year. Those two possible times correlate to when Elizabeth probably got pregnant. So when you factor those two things in, just to kind of cut to the chase on this, when you factor those two dates in, you have two possible birth times for Yeshua. One of them would be if she got, if she, if Elizabeth was six months pregnant in, in March, it would have been in December, which is very interesting because one of the years, the birth year of Jesus is in much debate. So I'm not going to go into that, but it's anywhere between two or three BC and two or three or four, possibly, you know, AD. One of those years, actually December 25th coincides with Kislev 25th. They landed on the exact same day. It's very possible. This is when Jesus was born, but if he wasn't born then, what a lot of the uh, uh, scholars and, and a lot of messianics believe is that Yeshua was born during Sukkot. Sukkot, we talked about before. It's the eight-day yes. festival. Remember now, this is the eight-day festival that is celebrated in the fall. And it's a harvest festival. Um, 
It is said that the reason, so remember when I said that it's kind of speculation that the reason the Hanukkah is eight days was because the, the, the menorah stayed lit for eight days. Again, that was added a bit later. Really, historically, what they're, what's more accurate is that they were not allowed to celebrate Sukkot. And God is very firm about celebrating Sukkot. People don't even realize that. I mean, he says, the nation that does not honor Sukkot, I will withhold rain. So what is actually more historically accurate is that what the Jewish people were doing when they rededicated the temple, the very first thing they were doing was celebrating the Feast of Sukkot. So that particular year on Kislev 25, Sukkot happened as well. So this is where it all kind of comes together. It's very interesting because Sukkot is also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. Yes. John, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word for dwelt is the word tabernacled. The word became flesh and tabernacled with us. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of people believe he was born during Sukkot. When Mary and Joseph, where there was no room for them in the inn, right? And then we, we know that they went, they, they had to go to where the animals were. Oh. The word there that where they stayed was a sukkah. Okay, that they were put in the sukkah. They weren't in, some people say it was a cave. No, it was a sukkah. A sukkah is the temporary shelter that the Jews build yes. every single year for eight days. And they live in it to represent the time they were in the, uh, in the wilderness, the temporary dwelling. So all of this leads a lot of people to believe he was born during Sukkot. But here's what's super duper cool about that. If you reverse nine months, how long does it take to make a baby? Nine months, mm -hmm. right? Your, your woman's pregnant for nine months. If you reverse nine months from Sukkot, you have Kislev. Kislev 25 is, 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 is nine months later is Sukkot. That would mean that Mary conceived during Hanukkah, the festival of lights, that that light came into the world. And the Jewish wow. people believe that birth really begins, you celebrate new birth upon conception because that's when the new life begins. Yes. So that's what's kind of amazing is that it's okay to celebrate Christmas as Yeshua's birthday, as Jesus's birthday, because he was either born then historically or he was conceived during that time. So it's a really cool thing to really recognize that there is and this. The, and the word Hanukkah means dedication. Right. Yes. And and the 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 oil running out and using the candles to light the oil. I uh, understand that there's I don't know whether it's a legend or a tradition yeah. that when they when they retook the the temple yeah. from the Seleucid, you know, empire that they had run out of oil to light the candles. And so God miraculously multiplied the oil. Can you explain that one? Well, that's what I was saying that before that that's kind of looked more as legend. Um, now okay. it is now it's not, not necessarily by the Jewish people. Um, it is looked at, that. here's the deal. It was written, it, it could be legend, it could be true. It was written about, about two or 300 years, uh, more actually more like 400 years after it happened. It's in the Talmud. So, so the rabbis wrote about it, but it's, it's <clears throat> you could say, why was it written about? Well, in Jewish culture and, and faith, you're not supposed to celebrate the defeat of an enemy. God tells them, you don't sell, you celebrate God's victory but you don't necessarily celebrate the defeat of an enemy. And supposedly the Feast of Dedication had kind of sort of turned into that. That's, that's what they say as people oh, celebrating. This is when we took our enemy down kind of thing. And so that the, the story of the eight days of the, the candle lighting came in, that the, that the miracle of the eight days came in to sort of say, well, this is what we're actually celebrating. We're celebrating that the candles stayed lit for eight days so that it, people were still allowed to celebrate. That is kind of the short story of it, but it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. I personally love the story, but we yes. don't have any historical record of that actually in Josephus or in the Maccabees. Um, which the Maccabees are, are, are uh, a book written about the intertestimonial period between the Old Testament and New Testament. There are books, the book of the Maccabees. This isn't written about. It's just written about later in the Talmud. So that's why everyone says, well, if this was such a big deal, wouldn't they have written about it? The point of it is, still, the very first thing they did was to bring light into a dark place. Yes. The, the temple 
was dark. And the very that. first thing that they said, the very first thing we have to do is bring light wow. into the place of darkness. And in our own lives, when there's been darkness, when there has been sin, when there has been mistakes, when we have wrought abomination of desolation into our temples by bringing the wrong things into our body, what is the first thing that we're supposed to do? We turn to the light of the world, Yeshua, and we invite him into our tabernacle. Yes. We invite yes. him into our temple in order for him to bring his light into our dark prayed mm -hmm. place and to illuminate us. And so that is what's so special about this time in recognizing. I mean, I want to go back to John. That it's yes. very interesting when we read in John that of all times for the, 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 uh, the leaders to come to him, the Pharisees to come and say, tell us plainly, are you the Messiah? I mean, that's pretty interesting to me when they, it was a feast of dedication. This is the time they come to him because they knew the prophecies that a light was going to come into a place of darkness. And during a time they celebrated light coming into darkness, the feast of dedication is when Yeshua, we hear about him walking in the temple, which I think he went there to celebrate his birthday personally. <laughs> And this is when they come. Why not go back home to celebrate your birthday, right? This Beautiful. is when they come to him. It was as if they were looking for the Messiah at that time. And if they understood the books of Daniel and they understood mathematically everything lined up that Daniel said before, that everything that happened with Antiochus happened at the time that it happened, that yes. prophets prophesied by Daniel, they also understood that the time of Messiah, because Daniel, you know, in his 70 weeks, his 77s, they knew that they were at that time period. And they knew that it had to somehow coincide with Hanukkah, with this time of dedication. So I think that that's very poignant that they come to him at this specific time and say, tell us plainly. The dedication of the temple. Wow. Because Messiah was supposed to come and dedicate the hearts of the people back to God. And they still had Hellenized Jews during that day. There were still to that day, there were people that were still Hellenized, meaning they still yes. practice the Greek culture. And, and it was winter. So it was this time of the year, quite cold in, in yeah. Israel. And Jerusalem yes. is, people don't, people think it's hot all the time. Um, Jerusalem snows. Jerusalem gets very, very cold in the winter. My, I was uh, a rude awakening my first winter in, <laughs> in Israel. We woke up, we lived um, in this, uh, this area that was above um, the Valley of Hinnom. If you've heard of uh, Geben Hinnom, it's um, uh, where they talk about, where Jesus talked about where they, uh, uh, Gehenna. When he talks about Gehenna, there's this valley. And uh, it's where they would sacrifice uh, children to Molech. So that's why he calls it Gehenna. And uh, so we, we, we lived right above this area, a beautiful, beautiful area. Um, and one morning I wake up and it's snowing. It's about eight in the morning. Oh, wow. we, and, just, and we'd only lived there imagined. for a couple of weeks. So much snow coming down. And I wake my family up and Brian says, we had actually had a, a critic. We were there doing a production and a critic said, um, this show will never happen. Hell will have to freeze over before this. Will, we will ever allow this. And the next morning when it snowed in Gehenna, which is known as hell, Brian goes, well, I guess hell just froze over. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like our little, thank you, God, little reminder. <laughs> it was literally like 24 hours after that was said. It was a riot. But it's such a great promise where Jesus said, and I'd give them eternal life and they will never perish and neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Uh, this was his response when they said to him, are you the Christ? Yeah. Tell us plainly. And he, he said, I told you the works I do in my father's name, they bear witness of me and the works of Jesus in his temple in you and I, the temple of the living God. And his light shines, shines through us in this time and in this season. And I is there, go ahead. Is there any significance of the, the 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 candles usually are blue and white, or is that just the colors of Israel? Or is there, there's no real? 
It's just the colors really of Israel, you know, blue and white. Yes. That's the flag. That's why I have my blue and white on. <laughs> yes, it looks lovely. Um, yeah, it, it, you can really use any, you can use any candles for it. Um, you know, but one of the things that I do love of that you can, it's okay. My husband's crawling by. They told me you can walk by, honey. You don't need to crawl by. <laughs> so I, t- I warned her that you would need to come by at some point. And there's my so son. Funny. <laughs> so funny. Uh, he said, they are, they're used to this. I've, I, like I said, I've done a lot of programs over here. So they're used to having to crawl by. What was the question? I was starting to say something important. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the, the the lighting of the candles and the blue and oh, white. What yeah. this with Hanukkah, what you're supposed to do. So we have the Hanukkah, but one of the things you're that you're supposed to do is actually light a candle and put it in your um, window every night. What you're supposed to do is put your Hanukkah or even a single candle in the window. Now think about Christmas. There was a Christmas tradition for a long yes. time to put a single candle in the window. Right. This came out of Hanukkah. Because you're supposed to so let your light shine before shine. men for you don't put it, you know, you, uh, uh, what, what is that scripture? You know, that scripture where Jesus says, you know, your father, well, don't, don't absolutely. put it under a bushel, yeah, 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 let, it, let it shine and let the father, people will see your good works and glorify, and glorify God. your yes. father in heaven. And so, and I was talking about, you know, last night, even with our church about <laughs> one of the words for praise to praise God and to thank God is this is this word that means to cause to shine. Actually, the word halal means to shine. So wow. when we live for him, when we shine, we are praising him. That's us giving him glory when we let our light shine, shine. before. So let your light shine before men and therefore glorify your father who is in heaven. So we are supposed to be putting these lights on our window. We're not supposed to be hiding it. You don't hide your light, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. You know, we, we're supposed to be putting our lights in the window for everyone to see that our home has light. Our home is illuminated. And our home is our, you know, our bodies, like we talked about before, our temples. We're supposed to be letting it shine in everything we do. We should be living as a Hanukkah with that light that shines in us, that lights other people's light. There's so much more I could talk about. You can go into Zechariah and, and how, you know, you have the, uh, the, the menorah, the uh, menorah is lit in, in I'm not going to get into all that because that's even complicated, but the beautiful thing about this all is how we are supposed to be shining and we're supposed to be lighting a light. And so do we all have to give up Christmas for Hanukkah? No, we don't have to give up Christmas for Hanukkah, but I do believe Christians should light the candle on these things. I do believe we should put it in our window. I do believe we should tell people that there is light in this house, the light of the world, Yeshua, who chose to reveal himself on Hanukkah to the Pharisees. When they said, tell us plainly, he says, I'm telling you right now, I'm the son of God. He tells, in fact, if you keep reading, he says uh, uh, in verse um, 31, he says, many good works. uh, Oh, wait, wait, hold on. Where is it? He says, I give them eternal life. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my hand for my father and I are one. He, he outs himself as God right there. And they get mad at him. They try to stone him. Many good works I've shown you from my father for which do you stone me? And they say, for a good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. Is it not written in your law? I said, you're all gods. And we go into this whole thing, but he's talking about that. He is God. He says, uh, I, if I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. He says this during Hanukkah. So he reveals himself. So not only do we have most likely that he was conceived or born on Hanukkah, but we have himself revealing himself. We have him yes. revealing himself during Hanukkah saying, yes. I am the son of God. I am God. He, he, he goes into this whole thing, and this is when they want to stone him, uh, and they can't. In fact, I think it gives the season of Christmas a greater meaning and an understanding of the fact that Jesus is the light of the world that we put out there and share him as the light of the world, and uh, that no matter how small our uh, army of resistance looks no matter how insignificant we think we are that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world that god will give us greater strength 
to overcome what seems insurmountable, what seems impossible. So it's a it's a beautiful story of again, you know, where God, uh, where the angel appeared to Mary, and she said, "How will this be?" And he said, "With God, all things are possible." Now, and, now uh, imagine if that happened on Hanukkah. Imagine if she knew that this was a time of impossible miracles. Imagine if those words were given at Hanukkah, this time of the supernatural with God, all things are possible. She would remember what happened with the message. That, that just resonates so much that this is a time of all things impossible, that God can do impossible things. So don't you want to just pray into that right now, Jean, those people who are watching with us and they might be facing impossible things. They might feel weakened in their circumstance and bodies. Just pray as the Holy Spirit needs you. Thank you. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it encourages us, that it even encouraged Yeshua before he went to the cross, that it encouraged uh, the, this, uh, these Maccabeans to see in your word that yes. with God, all things are possible, that even if it's only an army of 300, we can defeat 300,000 when we yes. have you on our side. That your word tells us no weapon formed against us can prosper because you created the blacksmith that created the weapon. That you are in control of all situations, even when it seems impossible. You are the God of the impossible because you make all things possible. When we trust you, Father, I pray encouragement to people's spirits right now. If they've been feeling afraid to speak out for what they believe in, we're not talking about talking out in anger or frustration. We're talking about speaking the truth in love. But so many believers right now are afraid to even speak the truth in love. We're afraid because the culture tells us, sit down, shut up. Nobody wants to hear your religion. Nobody wants to hear what you have to say. But you have told us that there's going to come a time where there's going to be a great falling away and many people are going to, many believers are going to turn away. They're going to be afraid to use their mouth, but there's going to be a remnant that is going to rise up because they know yes, their God is yes, yes. shall be strong and carry out yes. great exploits. I pray, Almighty God, in this season Ooh, that we know you hallelujah. greater than we've ever known you before so that we Thank can you, rise Jesus. up and carry out great exploits. Yes, so we're Jesus. not afraid of the armies that are coming against us. So we are not Thank afraid you, of the, uh, the thing that looks impossible. So we are not afraid of the circumstances. But we say we will bow to no other God but our God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Malach HaMelechim, Adonai Adonai, yes, Yeshua Jesus. HaMashiach. That is the only one knee that we will bow to. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Yeshua is Lord, but we will never Thank take a need to Jesus. anyone but our God. Thank you, Jesus. Encourage, oh Father, your people Thank you, to walk in your footsteps that you have ordained in the word for us to walk in, to walk in your truth, to walk in your law, to not reject Thank the things you, even Jesus. if they seem scary in a time of darkness, but to allow our light Thank to you, shine Jesus. in a dark place. Thank you. May this light in us shine. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much. That's just such an encouraging word for this season. And uh, uh, what a difference it makes to the Christmas story. It adds such depth and such light in the season of darkness. So thank you, Jen. And Thank you to your family for <laughs> crawling through. <laughs> Love it. And, uh, I'm trusting the Lord that next year in Jerusalem. Next year in Jerusalem <laughs> and maybe next year in South Africa for me. Yes. <laughs> yes. The borders are opening. I'm going to make Amen. it, but I don't have to wear a mask for 26 hours to get there. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. No, no, no. I wouldn't let that stop me. I love you. Thank you again love for you. joining me and me. I appreciate it so much. God bless you and your family and your amazing church. Thank you. Amen. God bless you guys Thank too. You. Your amazing church. I already feel like you're family with me. I feel like I know you guys. Yes. So, yes, we are. God great bless. holiday season. Same to you. Right. Good night. Bye. God bless.